Hi, welcome back to Introduction to Sociology. I am here at beautiful Lake Waccamaw, North Carolina. Thought I'd give you a nice backdrop for today's lecture. Um, today we're talking about race and ethnicity, which are two separate things. Um, first of all, when we talk about, remember in the last chapters we were talking about things being socially constructed. Race is also a social construct. According to anthropologists, in, in terms of strict biology, we are all Homo sapiens sapiens. That's our species. That's who we are, no matter what we look like. What we look like, that's our genotype. Um, the phenotype, which is what you look like, your skin color, your eye color, your hair color, the other things that we've decided that were important are arbitrary. We've decided to pay attention to those. We could have arbitrarily decided that eye color was important or height or size or, you know, uh, the big toe. <laughs> um, biologically speaking, phenotype, uh, what these, these characteristics that produce appearance have nothing to do with intelligence, with ability, with anything like that. And so race is a social construction, something that throughout our history we have used as a concept. And in this concept, unfortunately, it's been used to fight wars. It's produced a lot of hate and a lot of atrocities. Um, but it can also produce beautiful diversity and respect for and learning about other people's cultures. So let me, say, let me say a little bit more in America, and especially being here in the South, um, race as a social construction. When we think of, let's say, Barack Obama, we think of him as the first African-American president. However, why don't we think of him as white? It's like his dad somehow counted more than his mom who was white. Um, his skin color somehow counts more, and we don't really seem to be comfortable with the category of mixed race yet in America. Um, other cultures are comfortable with this. If you look at page 243 and read a little bit about Brazil, that will give you a deeper understanding of what I'm trying to get across. In Brazil, there are hundreds of different words for phenotype for racial uh, classification based on what you look like, hundreds, based on hair texture, based on eye color, based on skin color, based on other characteristics, different uh, hair textures. Um, just because it's what we do in the U.S. doesn't mean that's how it's done around the globe, which is an important point to keep in mind. In the United States, we, because of our, the legacy of slavery in our history, we tend to have something called the one drop rule. If you have one drop of black blood, you're black. That's it. Um, it's not the same in other countries. In colonial Mexico, when, it was, when Mexico was ruled by Spain, you could buy a certificate of whiteness. They recognized that race was socially constructed. And if you had enough money you could go by the social status attached to being white, even if your skin was very, very brown. But they recognized that this is a social construction. So these things change over time, over place. Um, some societies realize that they are social constructions. Other societies, like ours, tend towards that one drop rule, a very strong historical legacy that we have with that. Um, a brief word about terminology and history in the American context. In the American context, in the 1940s, early 50s, the polite term for African American was Negro. That was polite. In the late 50s, early 60s, it was colored. That was polite. Now colored is applied to any non-white person, but then it meant an African American, and it was the polite term. It was not an insulting term. In the 1970s, with the Black Power Movement, they reclaimed the word black with the slogan, Black is Beautiful, and it was considered most respectful to refer to African Americans as black. 
And because that's the time that I grew up in, you'll hear me switch back and forth between black and African American, which didn't really come in until the late 80s, early 90s. So even our terms change over time. But I, I prefer uh, black because it comes from the community. They said, this is what we are. This is what we want to be called. It didn't come from somebody else. And so I tend to have a little more respect for that term, but I respect all the terms in their context. Okay, um, ethnicity is something a little different. When we think of race, it's usually something that you can see. You can see race. You can't see ethnicity. Ethnicity is more about a shared ancestry or culture. Um, if you're from uh, Lithuania, you know, in America, nobody can tell that you have a different culture by looking at you. That's an ethnicity. Um, it's an ancestry. That's an ethnicity. It's, it's not a race. They can't tell by looking at you. Um, another example of ethnicity is uh, Jews, Jewish people, bound by ancestry and culture, but you wouldn't necessarily know by looking at anybody that they were Jewish. So ethnicity tends to be a little bit more about ancestry as it is handing down a specific culture, a specific set of traditions of a people. So race is what you can see, and ethnicity has more to do with culture. Now this is not to say that different groups don't have culture, but I'm making a distinction between race and ethnicity. Another distinction is between minority, minority groups and dominant groups. Now in sociology, minority does not refer to how, how many people there are. Neither does majority. It refers to how much power they have. It means, so when you hear that, you know, uh, Latinos are a minority group and you think, ah, but look at the population, there are so many Latinos. It's not about that, it's about how well are they represented in government? How well are they represented in business? Is it proportional to, do they have social power proportional to their presence in the country? And so that's why sometimes you can have minority groups who are majority populations. Like we have a lot of this in the Southwest. Um, a mi minority group will have a majority population. And here in the South, there are a lot of, this is the greatest concentration of African Americans lives in the South. So there are areas where neighborhoods, towns, where they are the uh most populous in terms of population, but in terms of power, they're minor minority. So they are in a minority position when it comes to power. So it's all about power. So that's what the majority minority thing is about. It's about power. And that's why it's sometimes puzzling to hear people talk about the, min the minority and you think, well, half of the city is, you know, Latino or of Latino descent. Um, well, that's why. It's because if you look at Congress, if you look at the Senate, if you look at the people who actually have the power to make change in society, um, in positions of official power, they're not represented there. And so in terms of social power, they are a minority. So that's how that works. Okay, so, so far we've covered the definition of race, we all know that human beings are actually one, all the same species, Homo sapiens sapiens, but we have socially constructed ideas about race based on physical features or phenotype. Um, we talked about the terminology and then we talked about ethnicity. Ethnicity being something that you can't necessarily see, but has to do with ha an ancestry that hands down particular customs. And we talked about majority and minority, which refers to power and not numbers. Okay, now the second thing that comes up for us in this chapter is prejudice and discrimination. And this breaks down, in order to analyze it, we break it down into several parts. Prejudice is when someone, an individual, holds a negative view in their head 
about another person based on the social construction of race that they have for them. Um, people don't necessarily always act on their prejudices or talk about their prejudices, but these are simply prejudgments that people have that may or may not affect their behavior. So yes, you can be prejudiced and not discriminate. Um, that can happen. Um, unfortunately, we also have something where you don't mean to discriminate, but because of your unconscious habit of thinking in a certain direction, you end up discriminating without meaning to. And so it's, it's sort of double-edged sword there. Discrimination is an action. Discrimination is when you block someone's opportunity or progress because of their race, because of prejudice. So you act on your prejudice. Discrimination is an act. Prejudice is an idea. Discrimination is an act. Racism is when you're using a certain race as the basis for your discrimination. And institutional racism is when an entire social institution is using race as a basis for discrimination. Institutional racism is typically what sociologists are interested in. Um, here's an example. After World War II, there were many, many blacks, African Americans, who served in the armed forces. After World War II, they came home, they tried to get their uh, GI benefits for education, and the institution of education turned them away because colleges did not accept black students. You simply couldn't, you, it was discriminatory, you simply could not apply to a college and get in if you were black. That was, a, we lived in a segregated society at that time. And in, in case you're not up on your history, after World War II, we're talking about the mid-1940s to the early 1950s, um, people trying to rebuild their lives as they came back from being in that, in that war. And so they did have a few black colleges run by black people, but there weren't enough. There were very few because they didn't have the funding, the money, the philanthropists to fund them. The states wouldn't fund them. And so those colleges were overcrowded. They couldn't let black people in. And so that's institutional racism. When the institution of education was set up to systematically discriminate against black GIs, or blacks in general, um, because they wouldn't accept white students. It was, it was kind of like a country club that you know, says we only have to admit who we have to admit. So institutional racism tends to be what sociologists focus on, these large patterns. Remember, it's about large patterns and how they affect people. Okay. Now, with all of the messages that we get about different races, Latino, Asian, white, every group has a set of stereotypes around it. When people of that group start believing the stereotype and judging themselves and others of their group by that stereotype, that's called internalized racism, meaning you've internalized those values. Let me give you a couple of like, examples of this. In um, African American culture, standards of beauty, there's something uh, that was quite common called the paper bag test. And they're talking about a brown paper bag like they use using grocery stores. If your skin, they held it up to your face, and if your skin was the same color as the paper bag or lighter, you were considered beautiful. That's internalized racism. They, what they had done was internalize the standard of beauty from the white world that was beaming these messages to them that white skin was beautiful and dark skin wasn't. That's internalized racism. In Latino culture, it can come up as things like ojos de color, which means uh, green or brown eyes are considered more beautiful. Well, that's what the Spaniards had. And so this has been, especially in Mexico, among Mexicans, um, they were judging themselves by Spanish standards, by European standards 
standards. And if you had eyes that uh, brown eyes were somehow not good enough. You had to have eyes that were green or blue like the Europeans did. That's internalized racism. You start applying those standards to yourself, which, you know, is when you experience it, it's very powerful. And you, a lot of minorities have to do something that white people don't have to do, and that is they have to unlearn all of those negative messages, stereotypes, and prejudices that have been put onto their group. And that's an extra social stress on dominant groups. Okay. We also have um, our indigenous or Native American groups. They're the result of colonization and especially being in the Southwest, in, in Portales, you know that the Treaty of Hidalgo meant that the border moved, that uh, Spaniards settled New Mexico, and Mexicans settled New Mexico, and they didn't immigrate, the border moved. They woke up one morning, and they were American. <laughs> and people forget about that. Um, so not every Latino that you see is an immigrant. Um, and all the white people are immigrants. We all came from European countries. We immigrated into the U.S. and colonized these people. So let's talk about our theory. And this is now you'll see why I wanted you to really get theory in that first chapter. It's it's because um, oops, the sun is getting in here. Okay. Um, it's because it comes in really handy now if you thoroughly understand functionalism and conflict theory to start hooking it in to institutional racism. Um, so what does functionalism say about racism and prejudice? It says it's functional, that it serves a purpose in society. Um, it gives society a scapegoat for the ills of society. Whatever's wrong with society, you can blame the person that looks different. It serves a function. It serves a purpose in keeping society together. If, if the economy is horrible, everybody can focus on someone who's different from them and blame them instead of looking carefully and analyzing the actual economic problem. And so that's what a functionalist would say. Um, a conflict theorist would say that race is the cheapest, that fomenting prejudice is the best way to get cheap labor. Remember, conflict theory is all about the economy. It's an economic theory. The owners are interested in cheap labor. How do you get it? You hire minorities who will work for less. And then, to keep the white people from rioting, you, you basically encourage them to blame the black people for taking the jobs instead of blaming the white owner for employing the cheapest labor. <laughs> For, so the owner, the capitalist, is using racism to his advantage. The idea that these people are somehow not worth enough, they're not worth enough to be paid more. So they're using the ideology, encouraging their workers to have the ideology, um, and what ends up happening is they don't have to take the heat for not hiring the white guys. This happened in history. Um, there are lots of history books written about labor history, where you can see this happening. Okay. So what happens when different groups come together? What, what, how do societies and these big groups in societies typically react? Well, it, there's a range, and some of it's very extreme. Sometimes there's genocide like the Jews in Hitler's Germany in 1940s when we fought World War II over this issue, um, they simply killed them. Genocide is simply killing an entire uh, what we call race of people uh, because they are that race or ethnicity of people. Um, that's genocide. You, you take, you're so prejudiced that you actually want to kill them all which is terrible. Um, but that's one of the things that does happen. It's happened in Cambodia, it's happened in Darfur, it's, it's happened uh, with Native Americans here in the United States. Um, 
history is full of examples of genocide. It's not pretty, but sociology is about figuring out what actually happens, not what's pretty. The second thing is population transfer. When a group decides it doesn't want another minority group around, it can do what America did to the Native Americans. In addition to genocide, those who survived were forced onto reservations. Um, they can force them out of the country. If it's a country, they can expel, like uh, uh, European countries expelled the Jews in the Middle Ages. Um, uh, Catholicism, the popes of the time in the 15, 14 hundreds and during the Inquisition expelled the, all the Jews from uh, Italy, from France, from Spain. And it happens, there are contemporary examples of that too. Another way is segregation or apartheid. This is how America worked and to some extent we have economic segregation that keeps the races apart because of economic differences between races. But when the segregation is actually in the law, like it was in the 1950s and 60s in the United States, that means that legally um, every race, there are separate drinking fountains, separate restaurants, separate theaters, the races do not mix by law. And that you can be arrested and go to jail if you do mix. This In South Africa, we're familiar with this under the name of apartheid which is running your society in that way. Now, the two more positive aspects of when groups come together, majority minority groups come together, is assimilation. And you've probably heard this like the melting pot, where the minority group tries to assimilate into the dominant group, adopt their customs, culture, and language. Now, the other alternative to that is multiculturalism, which you might have heard called the salad bowl. America is a salad bowl, where everyone retains their own shape and flavor of their culture, but we're all mixed up together in this salad bowl, and diversity is a good thing. And so that's the other way to think about it. So we've got genocide, population transfer, segregation, assimilation, and multiculturalism when different groups come together. Now, the major ethnic groups in the United States are African American, Latino, and, and you really need to, to learn to separate uh, Latino from immigrant uh, because that, that causes a lot of prejudice and immigration is a completely separate issue. Um, we have Asians, Americans. Asians were brought uh, to build the railroads in the 1800s and that's how we got our uh, Japanese, our Chi I'm sorry, our Chinese uh, populations in places like San Francisco. The Japanese came as farmers. Um, Russians came to do uh, trading very early on in 1700s, 1800s to do fur trading in Alaska and down the California coast. Um, but our major groups are African American, Anglo American, Asian, Native American, Indigenous, that includes Pacific Islanders, people from Hawaii, and Latino. Now some people say Hispanic, some people, uh, some Hispanics prefer Latino because of the origin of the word. Um, and that's, that's sort of a long story. If, actually, if you're interested in that story, leave me a comment and I'll come back and tell you the rest of it or send me a message and I'll, I'll answer it for you. Okay. So I'll let you read about the groups within the U.S. Um, in the book. That's the, the last part of the chapter. And I will see you for the next lecture. Bye-bye.